Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Ronnie Pinoy. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers. Uh, and I'm really thr thrilled to welcome you all to this conversation. Um, I'm calling from the lands of the Piscataway and Anacostan people um, on the lands uh, colonially known as Washington, DC. And I want to begin our conversation tonight um, by paying respects to um, the ancestors past, present and future um, of those people. Um, I am a guest on these lands. Um, my background um, is that I am um, uh, Laguna Pueblo and Cherokee. And so I'm uh, thrilled to have been on um, these lands and working with um, many Piscataway and Acostan people over the course of the last 10 years. So um, thank you very much for that. And now I'm um, happy to extend an introduction to, I guess, more myself and the other members of my team. Um, so I am a, a one of the Producer Hub team members, along with my colleagues, uh, Sophie Blumberg, and uh, Brian Hunt that are also uh, producing this event tonight. And the topic of tonight's conversation is pitching in the time of the pandemic. Um, and for those of you for whom this might be your first producer hub conversation, um, I just wanna give the briefest of introductions to what we're up to tonight. Uh, so the producer hub is less than a year old. We launched it in this pandemic moment that we're finding ourselves in. Um, and it's really a, it's a virtual platform and gathering place for independent producers and other makers of live performance to come together and uh, really better our practice to, uh, to examine uh, the ways that we produce, the ways that we share work, the ways that we are, um, and, asks ourselves, and ask ourselves the questions of how we can, how we can do better together. Um, so while the producer hub really focuses on the work of the independent producer, as that's a space that we feel um, hasn't had a lot of uh, support historically. We really welcome um, conversation across the live performance field um, about how we can um, about how we can move forward towards a more um, just and equitable arts practice. So that's a, a little bit of the producer hub um, in in a short bit. Um, I'll throw out that please, if you haven't been to the Producer Hub website, um, please do join us at um, producerhub.org. Um, and I'm now looking at the comments coming in and I'm seeing some awesome people here. Hey, B. Hey, Angelique. Thanks so much for being here tonight. So uh, with that, I'm gonna um, go ahead and just get us di to dive in and start this conversation. Um, so we have three phenomenal humans joining us tonight who I am thrilled um, are sharing their time and expertise with us. Uh, so first up, um, I'm happy to introduce Madeline Sayette, who is a director, writer, and actress whose work explores decolonization, Shakespeare, and the harm and healing of the stories we tell. And then Tommy Kriegsman is a creative producer and founder of Archetype, where he collaborates with many artists and institutions, creating live performance, and also the lovely Brett Porsche, who's the ex executive producer, excuse me, executive director of Utah Presents, and the assistant dean for art and creative engagement in the College of Fine Arts at the University of Utah. So I'll let them all, you know, say hi a little bit additionally as we get started. Um, but first, thank you all so much for joining us tonight and for talking about pitching and all of the many things that that means. Uh, so first, um, this is gonna dovetail a little bit from our prep call, um, but one of the first things we talked about is that pitching can mean many different things to many different people. Um, it can also have a little bit of a bad rap. Uh, so how do you each work with others to advance potential projects, whether it be as an artist, producer, or presenter? Um, and how is pitching an active part of your practice or not? Um, and Maddie, I'm going to start by throwing it over to you. <laughs> okay. um, hey, everybody. I'm Maddie. Maddie. I'm a citizen of the Mohegan tribe uh, here in Connecticut, where I am zooming in from uh, our traditional lands, uh, which are also the traditional lands of the Mashantucket Pequot and Eastern Pequot. Um, yeah, this question is so interesting to me because I... I don't really, uh, you know, pitch in a in a formal capacity. Um, I, but I have lots of conversations with lots of different people, and I feel like so often um, the really good relationships come out of uh, a shared mission 
or um, you know interest in the same things, all of my work does come from relationships, right? Like everyone's work is is built out of relationships. Um, but there's, it, I can't think of any instances which I've ever done, had to do like a 30 second, um, you know, uh, pitch, pitch. And uh, it's worked as well as sort of like my overall career of like discourse and dialogue and being in constant relation with people. And I think that's because um, so much of my work is, um, well, to be honest, it's not work where I can just trust someone. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I have a very, uh, due to like a lot of experiences early in my career, I, I don't trust a lot of producers. And so whenever I'm actually engaging in collaboration, uh, I, I feel less like ever, mo I've, I've never felt motivated to try and pitch someone something, but actually it's more of a, a care situation where um, because of so many, much of my work having to do with, um, you know, I work as a director, we imagine a lot of classics, but then I also, as a playwright, um, you know, tell stories that are very personal to me as a native person as well. And because of a lot of the experiences I've had with producers who um, approach indigeneity in a very uh, tokenized transactional manner where they have expectations of a kind of, you know, feathers and fringe reality that is never what I'm going to give them. I have to actually genuinely um, trust that this person is not seeking to do something harmful before I can even engage in any kind of a collaborative process. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's actually affected a lot of a lot of my work over the years. And also, I, I also very actively have always been, you know, blogging very specifically my viewpoint, um, you know, in the in the COVID era, that's translated to a lot of panels. So I feel like people who are drawn to my work are drawn to like both my work and my ideology as much as anything else. And I feel like for me, that's been really liberating because I'm not the kind of person I think who is like very confident to like go in and be like, blah, 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 blah. Here is my, you know, um, I, I don't have that like, like swanky car salesman vibe. Um, I just, I can't, I don't think I can pull that off. I'd probably like turn red and puke. Um, so um, I'm very grateful that I have found over the course of my career, alternative uh, methods for relationship building that feel very long lasting um, as opposed to having to, you know, adhere to any particular existing format. No, Maddie, I so appreciate that because I, I think that, um, while um, like I'll, I'll definitely speak for myself and I'm sure and Tommy and Brooke are going to speak to this in a moment, but um, pitching is um, I, I, a big part of what I feel like I do in my practice. And what I love is uh, the way that you're framing it. It's that that's not the only way to actually communicate with other people about what you do and advance projects and build work and build a body of work and a practice and a career, you know? So there's, there's many different ways to do it. And I also feel like there are, also ways to pitch that don't feel quite so much like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and, you know, um, you know, feel uh, um, a bit more in the kind of relationship base. And I'm curious now, um, if I throw it over to you, Tommy, next, if you can talk a little bit about what, um, how you work with others to advance projects and how pitching is a part of that. For sure. Um, <clears throat> Tommy Kriegsman, uh, pronouns are he and his, um, calling from the traditional territory of the Lenape tribes, past, present, and future, and the colonialized land known as Brooklyn in the state of New York. Um, so uh, pitching is a huge part of what I do because as a non-artist, I am taking the seeds of ideas and I'm starting from that, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 pivot point and trying to navigate the project on behalf of the artist all the way to fruition and all the way through as, as much of a lifespan as it can possibly have. So in order to do that, I have to, um, I have to pitch, I have to pitch a lot and I have to talk about the work in as active and energized a way as I possibly can. And I have to, um, figure out how these high risk works because everything I do is high risk, right? Everything, I would assume that every producer on this call and, you know, mostly in the world, they're choosing, to activate a piece of theater because they think it's necessary. Um, and I, I choose to go after work that I feel is, uh, is as necessary as I can, as I can make work be. And it's usually because it's got a very, very, um, political position and it's got a, uh, a, a voice that I believe to be essential and that may not be heard, uh, in, uh, in, a, in as often and as, uh, uh, magnified a way as it should be and, um, and celebrated. And so, in order to activate that and activate that 
and to build the bridges between my the artist and whoever's going to be supporting that artist to make that work happen, I'm the one who is doing that. And I'm the one who has to do that um, you know, very, very carefully. And, um, um, and also with a knowledge of not just what the artist is bringing to the table, but what I'm bringing to the table in terms of the servicing of that relationship, and also what the presenter is bringing to that table. And I'm coming in with assumptions. I've done my research on that presenter or that venue or that regional theater or that independent producer. I've done as much as I can do in advance. I want to know if they've ever come in contact with the artist or with anybody associated with the artist. You know, I want to know if they uh, have programmed something in their past that is along these some same lines. I want to know if I'm asking them to take a what I know to be a gigantic step in a direction that they have never, ever, ever, ever uh, gone to, or if I'm making a very slight step, or if I'm doing something that is really aligned with what I know their values and goals and mission to be. Um, and I do believe in the value of bringing um, extremely challenging work to those who do not normally um, support extremely challenging work. And I also trust that in that situation, I can be as um, in service to the artist and caring of the artist when that situation cannot be, um, that we can get through that situation and that I can prepare everybody involved to, um, to care for that situation as much as possible. That's not easy to do at all. And that has failed a number of times, but that is the goal. Um, and on the other side of it, the artist and I always come out and we've learned a lot and we can take those lessons on to um, to another challenge. Um, and that all has to do with the idea that, you know, distribution is really, um, it's just something that I, I, I really believe in. I believe in the, the um, you know, the way a piece can activate in different circumstances within different cultures, within different cultural frameworks, within different ideologies, and um, that that actually enhances and enriches the piece. Um, so that's what my pitches essentially contain when I'm talking to somebody about them. No, and I appreciate that, Tommy, because you really talk about pitching as an ongoing practice that is getting reinformed and um, is becoming more robust over time. So I, I appreciate mm -hmm. that that framing. Mm -hmm. um, and Brooke, I'd love to uh, hear you jump in on this as well, um, to hear from, from your perspective as a presenter, mm -hmm. um, as a partner, how you advance projects um, and how a pitching is, is and isn't a part of that. Right. Um, well, uh, again, I'm, I'm Brooke Horsch and I'm based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, we are on the ancestral homelands of the Goshute, the Ute, the Paiute, and the Shufoni peoples. And um, we are so uh, grateful to them for all of their stewardship, both past and present, of this amazing um, place that we get to, to be guests on. It's, it's a beautiful landscape with many, many um, beautiful resources. So... Um, so I, you know, pitching is interesting for me because I need all forms of it, to be honest. Um, you know, you had kind of alluded to sometimes pitching gets a bad rap when you set up the, the topic. And, and it's true. It does. I mean, um, I, I'm a presenter that mostly is focused on mission driven work and all, you know, the, all of our artists do some kind of engagement work when um, they're joining us in this community. Um, but the depth of that it varies. And I'm also a presenter that um, is largely self-funded. Um, so I have to present along a spectrum, which means sometimes I need to do things that are really easily recognizable, um, not necessarily commercial, but recognizable, right? Which means that um, those kinds of projects generally can be pitched to me in a really um, sort of familiar format, right? Like I don't have to get to know the, the artist or the agent really deeply. We're not gonna do you know, something challenging like Tommy is referencing. Um, and, and those pitches, that are really straightforward in that way are useful because I need those projects. I need those options. Um, but I'm also a presenter that dives deep into um, lots of interesting topics, challenging work um, and contemporary work. And so I also need the pitches that come from relationships. Um, I need the ones where uh, an artist or an agent is, or a manager producer is gonna really listen 
to what we're trying to accomplish and who our community is, who's here or who we're trying to serve. What are the challenges? Um, where are the opportunities? And then, and then really be able to trust that person to, to tell me about projects or artists that are a good fit for them. Mm. Um, so we do, need, we do need all versions of pitching. Um, and, and I think I, I try to signal if, if what you're gonna pitch me, if I know right from the beginning that it isn't gonna be a good fit from that moment. Mm -hmm. But I also try to sit in a space that's open because oftentimes it's what you don't know about that ends up being the thing that you need the most, right? So being willing, I mean, this sounds crazy. I get so many emails per day about those, but I really do try to look at every one of them before I delete them. Um, because there might be something there that that's unexpected, right? Yeah. I'm just one person. So I can only know about so many things and I have to rely on all different ways of pitching me, whether it's an email or a phone call or a showcase or a word of mouth. Like I have to rely on all those things to really fill my hopper of potential uh, collaboration full up so that there's lots to choose from. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, and I think you covered so many valuable things in there that one thread that I'll I'll just pull out from from a lot of what you're saying is is trust and you know, doing your research and understanding and listening, you know, and really hearing um, uh, what is happening on the other end of the conversation. Because mm -hmm. um, I think pitching can often, I mean, at least when I was first starting, the kind of idea of pitching I had in my head was very one way, mm -hmm. um, and and everything that this group is sharing, it's really. Um, so much more dialogue than a than a one-way dynamic. Yeah, I mean, I just have to um, respond to that to say that there are, th I have um, partners, colleagues out there, you know, Ronnie, you're a great example of this, where I've come to trust Octopus Theatrical's um, own choices around curation, right? Because you're curating a roster of artists. And so I will come to you and say, hey, I'm looking for something like this. Um, I don't know where it is or what it is, but this is kind of what the parameters are. This is the need I'm trying to fill. Do you have anything along those lines? And then you, so sometimes I'm pitch, I'm pitching it or I'm asking for a pitch, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, and that's, I think that's right on. And um, it really gets it like pitching as a wider series of relationships and um, the ecosystem that we're all a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and Tommy, I want to go back to you to expand a little bit more on um, the way that you were talking about um, articulating an artist vision. I'm I'm curious if you can, because I, I feel like this has been something that um, a lot of independent producers have um, uh, been asking for in this moment is like, what constitutes a good pitch? Mm. You know? And, um, you know, being the producer hub, I think understanding um, what the components of that are, I think would be you know, really valuable for a lot of folks. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I think what constitutes a good pitch uh, is that, you know, when, it, when it's really going well in, uh, you know, in, in, in a tete-a-tete -tete conversation between yourself and a potential partner, um, all of the, what you're describing is aligning, you know, bit by bit. Um, that what they're reading into what you're talking about, because every, of course, piece of art or, or you know, uh, especially a piece of theater has so many dynamics about it. It can be seen in a million different ways. It can be performed in, you know, so many different contexts. It can be understood in so many different ways. Um, each work has its own effect on audiences that may be, uh, more new to subject matter or way more advanced in subject matter. So when I'm within that, um, the, the framework of a conversation with a with a presenter or a venue or a partner or a regional theater or other, um, I'm trying to take it from the point of view of what their communities are going to respond to um, and what community they may be trying to uh, 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 be yeah. more welcoming toward. Perhaps. Yeah, um, or um, or be more inventive and responsive too, um, and 
that's a huge part of what that pitch is going to do and where, I, where I'm going to be putting certain works on the table where I'm not going to be putting certain works on the table. Um, and I, I mean, it, I should come from a sort of very specific place, which is that when someone is sitting down with me, there are probably 30 pieces that we could be talking about at any given time. So I have to be very careful about how I gauge that um, and not waste anybody's time. That's a very big part of why people like Brooke are even willing to sit down with me is that I'm not going to waste their time. Um, and uh, because there are uh, 3,000 works that they can be choosing from at any given time. So how do you make yours a priority for them? Um, part of that is my choosing of work and the power inherent to that work um, and uh, making sure that that work is of a certain quality and of a certain uh, power and of a certain aptitude and, and depth that is going to respond to all these mechanisms. And then another part of it is, um, uh, uh, you know, simply how that work is going to be um, uh, uh, able to be positioned. So a successful pitch ultimately is going to give a, a partner immediately an understanding of how that work is from beginning, middle and end. Um, and that's a very short time frame in order to create that picture, I think. Um, you know, they have to understand what it is from a marketing perspective. They have to understand what it is from an internal perspective of how their staff is going to treat and respond to that work. And they have to understand it from a community perspective um, and from the artist's perspective about how they're going to care for the artist and how that experience is going to be. Um, so, you know, it's it's one that ultimately um, equals a that there is there is great mutual reward to enter into this situation um no oh, right on and i and i also think it's worth um sharing for the folks listening that you know a lot of this conversation is existing uh looking at pitching as coming from a independent producer or artist towards someone who is going to be presenting their work you know fully completed but I just want to shout out that this is, of course, not the only way to be pitching work. This is not the only way to be building relationships. Um, whether you're a um, playwright who's in relationship with a, you know, a literary manager, whether it's a, um, you know, an artist agent, or you know, if you're, um, uh, I, I often, you know, think about the network of ensemble theaters and a lot of those ensemble theaters who are working with each other and doing exchange with pre presenting each other's work. Mm -hmm. So I think this ability of understanding, uh, first, you know, like doing some thinking about um, uh, who you're talking to and why and doing some kind of level of choice making before you get there, I think Tommy, to your point, is so critical. Um, so just so just to shout out that there were not, um, uh, there's not a assumption that this way of working is the only way of working. And I think a lot of what we're trying to, uh, the threads we're trying to pull out here can be more broadly applied. So just mm, to that. Yeah. Um, and I wanna actually shift to now to um, thinking specifically about everything we've talked about so far, but with, with the lens of the pandemic on it. Um, so, and Maddie, I wanna throw this question over to you. Um, how has the pandemic changed your approach? Um, and moreover, how has your community changed or your approach to working with that community uh, changed over time? Yeah, it's funny because until I started thinking about this a couple of days ago, I don't think I had realized how many people I work with right now that I never met in person. And it's well over 300 when I started counting people that I'm collaborating with right now that I have never met pre-pandemic. Um, and so, and that's like just, I just started, like it's probably quite a lot more than that actually, which is really interesting to me right now. Um, so uh, so for those of you who don't, so, so I am an artist in like multiple capacities. I'm both a director, a writer and a performer. And that sort of happened mostly because I was trying to be useful. Um, I was a performer and I felt like there were plenty of them. And then I, you know, sort of shifted to directing cause it was useful and then writing. And then somehow I ended up in a solo show and then it shifted all back over again, right? Um, but, but it was, it was a lot of that was actually just like, well, I want to be making things with people and I want to be useful. So what can I be doing right now that is useful? And, um, and what that's translated to in the pandemic is really actually for the first time, I'm actually able to do all of the things because, uh, we're not limited timeline wise to be in one place the way that we were before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm collaborating on so many things, both as an artist and as a scholar right now. 
um, in, in a way that would have never been possible before. In addition to that, for Native Theater, um, and I'm also, I am also the Executive Director of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program, and also a Co-Artistic Director of uh, Red Eagle Soaring Native Youth Theater. And, and for both of those programs, um, as well as all of my other work, accessibility for Native folks during the pandemic has been immense. Like growing up for me, like I didn't find out that there were Native playwrights until my final year of college because that's not what's accessible, you know, in, in a small town. You go to the bookstore, when, if you have a bookstore nowadays, you might not, right? You go to the bookstore and what's on the shelves is like 80 million versions of Shakespeare plays and you're not going to find a Native playwright and you're not gonna find that in school and no one's gonna teach you that they exist. But now suddenly what's happening is that you don't have to be in a city because actually no matter where you are, as long as you have internet service, which is a zone limitation, right? Um, you can access whatever whatever's happening. So a Zoom reading of a native play, while it might seem like silly to some people, you do that Zoom reading in New York City, you get 20 people to show up. You do that Zoom reading online and suddenly there's 2000 people watching. Um, and so the way that that has actually shifted the way that within native theater, we're able to collaborate and collaborate constantly um, and actually a lot of us all be in our homelands and still co be collaborating um, is really, really transformational. Um, and I'm really excited now um, by the possibilities that that offers. Like for example, I've actually, I've, I've, I've been privileged in that I've actually also been able to make a lot of art during the pandemic. I also understand that for a lot of people that hasn't been the case. A lot of this is realistically due to the fact that um, there was a shift in attention to um, to native peoples from producers or like you know during the pandemic um, in relationship to a lot of the, a lot of the harm that has been done to our communities um, and that was that was not necessarily true also pre-pandemic um, you know what happened with um, with George Floyd and also what happened with uh, native people facing the highest rates of death because of COVID. Like there were, there was a lot of movement that drew attention to um, our stories and our communities in a way that was not true before. Uh, but, but what that means is that now we're creating all of these opportunities for access. And even this spring, um, my solo performance piece, where we belong, is at Woolly Mammoth, and you know, structurally, there's a part of me as a theater maker that's like, ah, it's gonna be recorded and on film and that's not what it's supposed to be and that's like terrible and it's gonna like make me cringe. But then there's the other part of me that's like, if we did this show in DC, how many native people would be there? If we release this show online for two weeks, like it, it completely changes who the audience is and who's able to access it. Um, and so I was definitely one of those people who pre-pandemic was like a theatery theater person. And I was like scared of like all other mediums, you know? Um, and now I've been forced to um, to do voice acting, to create audio plays, to create Zoom plays, to do all of these things that like, you know, are messy the first time that you do them, but like open you up to more possibilities. And I actually feel like, um, you know, even though as a director, I think as a writer and as a performer, I feel much more engaged in this medium. As a director, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, to be honest, you know, when things are on Zoom. Um, but the, the way that it's changed the actual dialogue around accessibility, I think is really under undervalued. Um, because like if I was in high school and I could have seen one of these plays, like it would have changed my life. Um, you know, it would have been a completely different experience from then on growing up. And I've been able to create things like this year, um, we created uh, a Young Native Actors Award, um, and and around at, at the Indigenous Performing Arts Program, and around that, um, you know, programming um, where they get to take different classes and things like that, and then be sort of like you know brought into the national Native theater community. And then what does that do for everyone else trying to produce plays? When suddenly you don't have to cast thirty-five year olds as teenagers anymore, because suddenly you're like, aha, we know where all they they all are, you know. Um, so so all that is to say. Um, I think if anything, it's actually ex expedited the rate at which I can make relationships and meet people. Mm. And I was someone who was actually like for at least a, a couple years before the pandemic started because I was in the air constantly, like I was never in one place for more than a few minutes. I chose not to live in a city. And so that meant that like, I was like pretty much always away from home. Either I was like at 5 a.m. kind of like rolling onto the train at New York or I was like, you know, like flying somewhere. and honestly, like the ability to just like sit here in my apartment and be in like 5,000 places at once means that I can in some ways get a lot more done. Um, so yeah, so I think it's a really unique opportunity for relationship building where 
you can take, I went on longer than I meant to, sorry, but I just, I feel like people are really open to just talking um, across the entire world now in a way that wasn't true before. Um, and actually presents a lot of possibilities um, if you're willing to look for them. Yeah, and I think, I think too, to your point, um, that native theater is in a lot of ways become less fringe, I think for some presenters, because it's more, um, it feels more accessible to find because it's in, um, it's in video form. You can just jump in and join that Zoom reading that would have been, you know, um, I think there's a, a little bit more of an appetite for watching work um, that way as well. And I'm actually wondering, Brooke, if you have any thoughts that you would wanna um, add to this on how the pandemic has changed the way that you're experiencing work and building relationships and where it's been a barrier and where it's been an opportunity. Yeah, I think um, first I'll just say that um, not being able to sit in a space with artists and experience what it is that I'm being pitched on is a challenge. Um, you know, as a presenter, I am building a, a relationship of trust with with the community that I'm working in and with the audiences and as a predominantly contemporary, you know, non-commercial based presenter, I'm asking them to come to something that they don't know what it is. It's not, you know, I'm, you know, Phantom Limb, you know, it's amazing. I know it's amazing, but no one here in Salt Lake City is familiar with Phantom Limb because they're based on the East Coast and they haven't toured here before. So, so, part of like having the, the courage to like put all this stuff out there that we've curated um, is having seen it ourselves or having someone on our team or a really close collaborator having seen it and, and, and someone who knows our community and knows its dynamics um, say, yeah, we could do that here. It might be hard because of this, or it's going to be amazing because of this, right? Um, so that is a, that's a real challenge. Um, so you know, I think what everybody out there can take from that is, you maybe uh, think you don't necessarily need really good uh, ways for presenters to see your work in the virtual setting, even if it's just in development. But you do, because if we can't be there to see it in person in some way, then we have to turn to YouTube clips or, you know, recordings of the show. And um, if you're, the, the more effort you put into having those at the ready and having them be what it is you want represented, you know, not having it just be, you know, what you were able to pull off <laughs> you know, is, is important because we're putting a lot of stock into that, what we're watching virtually. Um, I would also say that keep in mind that, um, you know, we're all struggling. Uh, you know, I, I know artists are struggling. I know um, independent producers are struggling, but presenters are struggling too. And so when you're pitching right now, just remember in the back of your head that, you know, we're, so for example, Utah Presents, we've furloughed over 70 people in the past year. Um, we are down to a bare bones staff. And those are really difficult financial decisions to make, but we're making them because I want to have money to give and pay artists for the work that we are doing. Um, so be, you know, that's the difference now. Like I, my resources are so limited, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of people and, and, and creative capacity. Like we're just, we're all, we're all in the same boat. We're all um, working on um, really altered uh, resources right now. Um, so those, I would say, are the two ways things have changed. I think another thing, and this connects to what Maddie was saying, is that um, we're engaging in a lot more fieldwide conversations right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're trying to we're trying to reimagine what will be when we can come back. Um, and we're trying to deal with the reckoning that has needed to happen for so long. And so we're doing a lot more of these kinds of things. And and so I'm listening in these things and I'm watching these things. You know, I have never met Maddie before, but you better bet now's the time where I'm going to write down her name and be like, I'm going to go check out her work. Um, so I'm, I'm making um, connections in different ways, just the way um, Maddie is, because our our world has contracted in a in a geographic way, but it's expanded in a virtual way. Exactly, exactly. 
No, right on. Um, and I feel like there was so much that you that you just pulled in there as well about um, a lot of assumptions that I, f I feel like a lot of, assumptions maybe isn't the right word, but this, this moment has made so many people so vulnerable that the entire way that the, the timeline, the approach, the kind of rhythm that anyone in the contemporary, you know, performance booking kind of universe mm -hmm. is used to has shifted. And every presenter is different. Every artist is different. Every independent producer is different yeah. in terms of what's going on. And I think that just adds, it seems to me from what you're saying, it adds an additional layer of um, really, really asking where your colleagues are at before diving in as yeah. a big takeaway um, from this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, another question I want to, I want to speak, I want to ask about is, um, you know, this is taking a little bit of a turn, but I do think for folks who really want to get into the weeds of this, I think it's going to be valuable, which is, you know, what do you wish that someone had told you about either pitching or more broadly about building successful collaborations when you were first building your career? And and Brooke too, if you if you answer this question, I'm curious too if you could speak a little bit more to, um, you know, some of the um, uh, kind of like tips for success and traps to avoid. <laughs> sure. um, well, I, I, I'll start with that and then I'll end on the first question so then you can transition to somebody else. Um, so I would say um, things to avoid. Um, don't condescend to me about mm -hmm. your artists. Like I know, I know artists are amazing and I know they're doing amazing things, um, but don't tell me why I have to do that artist because I'm in this place and I'm navigating the complexities of the place that I'm in. So listen to the signals or the things I'm saying that are indicating if it's not the right fit for me and then respect that. Don't, don't try to create, <laughs> I think in our prep call, I said, don't try to, you know, hook me with FOMO. <laughs> like, don't tell me that the Cranard Center is doing it and expect that to be why Utah Presents does it. We're, very, very different. We have similarities, but we're very, very different. Um, and if I say no, you know, it's going to ask me to justify my no, to tell you why, so you you can understand it. But don't forget that I told you no. Don't come back to me, you know, a month later, three weeks later, two years later, and pitch me on the same thing. Um, because like Tommy said, you know, we all have limited time and you don't want to waste my time and you don't want to waste your own time, right? So remember the no. Uh, and uh, I would then also say, you know, a really successful way to be ready for a pitch is to particularly now is to understand all of the capabilities of the artist you're representing, the project you're re representing, or the, the things about yourself that maybe aren't apparent in that pitch description of the show. Because what I'm gonna ask you is, okay, that's great. I'm, I love to know that about the show and what the experience is gonna be for the audience that shows up in that on that night, on that day. But what about all the time I'm gonna wanna spend with you connecting you or connecting these artists to our community um, as part of the engagement? And I think community engagement um, around a ticketed show is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, you know, it's for as a presenter, it's it's why I exist, actually. I don't exist to sell the ticket to the show. I exist to create the connection between the artist and the community. So be ready to talk about that. And and I often will ask an artist or um, you know a group or you know what 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 else do you want to do? Like other than the show, what else are you interested in? What else what else fascinates you from what you know on our community? What do you want to learn from us? So be ready to answer those questions because that that's actually what's going to, I think, um, make you stand out. I noticed Diego asked a question about what makes certain um, things stand out to presenters when you, you know, we, we are always getting so much contacts is, um, yeah, there's that question. Ooh, fancy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, be ready with more than just your just your, you know, three minute pitch, be ready to talk about, you know, things that excite you beyond the, that particular project or ways that you want to learn from the community you're going to, you know, just be ready to talk about engagement. 
Um, yeah, so those those are a couple of things. And then as far as um, what do I wish I had known? Well, um, I wish I had, I've learned it and I'm glad I've learned it, but I wish I had known um, to be forward, more forward with <clears throat> saying, no, that's not the right fit for everything, for everything that isn't, right? So that I don't keep wasting um, the person who's pitching me's time, right? So I've learned that it's actually not, it's not mean. <laughs> I mean, you can deliver it in a mean way, right? But to just be really forward and say, no, thank you, not at this time. Um, and, and this really comes into play, I think, around conferences. And, you know, I get requests from a lot of people for meetings. And some folks' approach is to just ignore the request. Um, and my what I've learned is a lot kinder way and, and how I would want to be treated if I were reaching having to reach out for cold meetings is to say, thanks for your, you know, thanks for reaching out, but I, I don't need a meeting at this time. And if I do, I'll, I'll come back and follow up with you. Um, yeah. No, I love it. I think one of my favorite sayings that I've, I've definitely adopted is that the next best answer to yes is no. <laughs> You know, as opposed to this, un, un, like, oh, maybe, maybe, sort of. Should we keep talking about it? Um, no, can be a real act of act of love. Um, yeah, and Tommy, gonna kick it over to you. What What do you wish someone had told you, your younger Tommy self? Um, I think I think you know I, I think we all enter into a situation where we're constantly feeling like um, we're going to step over some boundary or we're going to cross a line or people aren't going to be as welcome to ideas. I, I, th I think there's a lot more fear that is instilled in us about that than um, that I think is warranted. I think somebody, if somebody had told me, be way more brave than you're being from the very beginning, I think it would have, it just would have been nice to, to take less time to come around to the fact that what I need to be doing is taking way more risk. What I need to be doing is bringing way more um, uh, uh, what I feel to be a more transformational capacity to the work that I'm bringing to people. I think the mistake is always underestimating who is across the table from you. Um, and there are lots of ways to do that. You know, I have my own issues with, um, you know, talking to um, someone with whom I'm sort of possibly, you know, you're talking to a university where you're prejudging what the cultural capacity of that university might be, you know? Um, it's a big football school. They're not going to come to shows on Saturdays. All the parameters that come with any, you know, situation that, you know, occurs is always kind of a prejudgment as to what, well, what work is going to be appropriate for them? What are they really going to agree to? What are they going to do? And I know, believe me, what it feels like to be sitting across from a blank stare when you're talking to somebody about something that is extremely important. And it has extreme relation and value to their community. And they're really not understanding where that is and how that works. And it's a terrible feeling. It's the worst feeling. You know, Brooke, it's sort of the, the opposite of like, don't, you know, don't, don't, you know, underestimate or, or, you know, don't, don't condescend me, but there's a, there's a part of it on the other side, right? Where you're being really condescended to by somebody who's like, yeah, no, we don't have gay people in my town. You know, and it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, you know, or, or just some feeling where all of a sudden it's like, this person is deep, deep, deep deeply unaware uh, around even the own dynamics in their city um, and doesn't care to, to talk about that. So, you know, the question about, and that, that is something I deal with all the time and it's very very it's it's, it's very it's 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 tricky and and deflating <laughs> to say the least so i think what you um have to really i think understand from the beginning is that the person across from you welcomes transformation welcomes change welcomes high creativity welcomes risk welcomes an extraordinary adventure and journey that they want to go on with a piece and trust that your you know, if you believe in your heart that you are bringing that, uh, bring it, you know, really bring it. Um, and, and, you know, figure out what the dynamics of that are and be, be as brave as you can in, in your delivery of that. And, and it will come back to you. It will come back to you. If it doesn't work for that person right there, the energy you're bringing to it is going to get to another person either through them or through another way. And it will happen. And so I think the trust in that inevitability is something very, very difficult to know for the beginning, but like, after doing this for 25 years, you know, the feeling of like, 
it's going to be okay. We're going to get there is a really good feeling to have. That's great. No, thank you so much, Tommy. Um, I think the, the be brave is a really, again, to bring that passion and to, to really know that, you know, clearly if you're working with an artist and you believe in them to really make, make all of that, uh, present, um, right on. I mean, I think that's a great piece of advice for folks. Um, I want to invite folks who are in the comment section, if you have additional questions, um, to go ahead and share them. Cause I think in a, in a couple minutes, we're going to move to a question, um, uh, to pulling questions from the chat. Um, before we do that, there was one more question, um, from me that I wanted to throw out to all of you, um, which was if you could each speak a little bit more about how trust, listening and transparency are a part of your process. Um, I know those are words that have, um, you know, a number of them have kind of um, already kind of made their way woven through the conversation. And I wonder if we can kind of um, bring this section of the conversation home, um, touching on those just a little bit and maybe some short responses um, this time, if you don't mind, so we could take some questions from the chat. Um, and Maddie, I'm gonna start with you. Sure. Um well, just I think also tying that to the question before also, I was just thinking a lot about, you know, like early in my career, well, not even early in my career, I guess like sort of pre-career, right? When they're like training you to be in the field, they're always trying to get you to like compare yourself to existing things as if mm -hmm. that's the thing that is most useful. And it's really not, um, you know, um, I feel like you need to know who you are and you need to know what you care about. And if you are consistent in knowing that, it's infinitely more valuable um, than, than trying to like pretend you exist in some sort of box. I mean, yes, like, yes, in order to pitch, there needs to be words that exist that can describe you. However, that does not mean that you cannot invent those words, right? It doesn't mean that you can't create the situation in which like that thing then exists. And I, I say that because um, like for me, so much of what I've done hasn't been, has actually been because I've been trying to like get out of containers people have been putting me in. And, and ultimately the things that I'm usually doing aren't necessarily received well at the first moment. Like I remember the first few times I went to the Shakespeare Theater Association, you know, like when I was directing all native Shakespeare's, like everyone was like, oh, so cute. You know, like it's like your community service project. Like that's kind of how it was treated. And then like now it's like everybody would like, like wants that, you know, it's like, oh, that's the thing that we need because everyone's like investigating now how Shakespeare's colonial. And so they actually have to examine these things. Um, and, and so things change, like things change but but you ultimately need to know who you are in relationship to the world around you. My solo show existed not because I wanted to write a play, but because I had something I needed to figure out. And then every time someone asked, said, "Can you do this again?" I've said, "Please no," you know, because I really isn't that fun to do. But <laughs> it, it, but it's it it stimulates interesting questions that I want to be asked in the world. And so then I'm like, oh, it's worth it to ask those questions. Um, and so in relationship to that, also trying to keep it short, but really failing, Ronnie. Sorry. Um, uh, the trust is so important because I recognize because I'm shifting positions so often that the amount of vulnerability that goes into any of these positions is perceived differently if you're a director, if you're a writer, if you're a performer, if you're a producer, but it exists in all of those spaces. And so you really need to be able to trust people to know that you, um, you're willing to go on that ride with them. And I feel like nothing, like I appreciate nothing more than when people like than having return collaborators. I feel like like return collaborators are like a gift in so many ways. One, because it means like, I almost swear it, I didn't, it means you didn't mess up that badly the first time, right? But then two, because, um, because like there's, a, there's like a comfortability there, right? When you go back into that relationship and you can deepen the work or you go back or the producer asks you back and they say, hey, what are you working on? You're like, oh my God, what am I working on? It's like the most generous thing you could say to me. I can do whatever I want. Um, right. And or, or playwright like trust you enough to keep bringing their plays back to you. It it it, it just means so much. Um, and so uh, anyway, so so all of that is to say that. Um, I think it comes from appreciating and understanding that vulnerability. And it's really hard when you are operating between cultures. And I recognize that as a native person, because so much of it has to do with the instances in which I did not receive respect. Very early on, I became a director, mostly because I had seen like a lot of non-native directors do really horrible things. And I was like, the bar is low. I was like, this, the bar is really low right now. 
So, um, so all I have to do is respect everyone. And actually that will be a great starting place. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so like being comfortable to ask the questions and be vulnerable and respect each other and like really respect each other before you take out your own securities, right? And like try and make it seem like you know what's going on and everything is okay. Like that kind of transparency, the transparency to actually be with each other and communicate and be vulnerable. Like to me, like that is what has, 100% built my career. Like there is no one I have ever worked with who is like, she always has it together. Like no one is gonna say that. I don't think so. Um, but they know that I'm always honest, right? And that actually means a lot more because that means the relationships are deep um, and that ultimately they can trust me and they know that I'm doing the work and that I'm thinking about things really deeply and that I'll, and that the producers I really trust, the ones where I can, I feel like I can come to them and say like, this thing happened and we need to address it. Not, um, you know, the ones who I'm scared of because I think that they're kind of coming and say something racist in my rehearsal, right? And so, and so really honoring, um, I think everyone's humanity is a big part of that for me. No, thank you for, for sharing the full thought of that because I think that's incredibly valuable, connects to the last question and um, it's it's foundational. It is the thing and it, and it underscores um, it's our own storytelling of, um, um, where we are, where we are and how we work the way we work. I mean, your, your background is informing so much of the way that you operate in the world. So I, I love the, the connections you're making there. And also why we tell stories, right? Which is different for different people. Right. Right. And I just have to say too, that, you know, Tommy, when you said about the, you know, that we don't have, um, you know, gay folks here, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that about native people, I'd be a, very rich lady. So, you know, um, it's, yeah, but anyway, but I digress. Um, I want to get back to, um, I, I want to make sure that I hear, um, um, Brooke and, uh, Tommy, um, on this question of trust, listening and transparency. And I also, I, the other question I'm seeing in the chat, um, I'm going to shout out to you, Meredith, that, I'm wondering if you um, still want to get an answer to that question. I think we might have answered it, but please give a ping if you'd like us to speak specifically to it. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. But um, folks in the in the comments thread, please shout out if there's a specific question you want us to get to. Okay. Um, yeah, Tommy, let's throw it over to you for trust, listening, and transparency. You know, I think every... Um you know, I think every producer on on this in this forum knows what it's like to get back into a situation or have to have a very difficult conversation about where a project has turned. Um, you know, and I think from the very beginning, they're you know part of that pitch process and where things um, really get established between you and um, and uh, a collaborator partner is is really um, you know establishing as much as possible that that not just that they can kind of trust what you're saying right now. I mean, very often I, I will catch myself saying things all the time in a pitch that are, they're, they're salesy. <laughs> they're really salesy. You know, I'm, I'm here to get the job done, you know, and I'm here to get the gig. And, um, and that, that's cool. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm okay with that, <laughs> but uh, that has come back to bite me in the ass for sure. You know, I mean, the situation changed. The artist had a different vision. Something got much more expensive. Things happened within that. What I need Brooke to be able to trust for me is that I'm going to, we're going to work through that and we're going to really get to figure that out. And I think that's implicit to the process that there's got to be that trust and engagement and a certain level of transparency about what could go uh, awry or what could just change and what pivots can happen within that process that um, I have to listen very carefully to them and they, uh, you know, have to listen very carefully to me to kind of understand what all those parameters are and what could possibly shift. And I have to get better about describing those things off the bat so that everybody understands exactly what journey they're going on. Um, so there, there really aren't surprises when those things happen. Um, as difficult as they can be, um, there, you know, there really shouldn't be surprises. And that's really particular to the fact that I'm very often starting from the seat of a work. You know, um, it, it's it's three years until I have a final thing with a final technical writer that is utterly mobile and just ready to roll and can load in in a day and boom, 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 boom. Until we get to that point, um, the artist needs to have all the freedom to do what they want, period. And I have to be the shield 
and conduit to allow that. Um, and they're looking at me for parameters. Um, I'm looking at them for parameters. The partner is looking at all of us for parameters, and you know we're all we're all doing the dance and trying to figure that out so we can all rise together. Um, so I think that to me is where like the the trust and transparency thing is really very key. Right on. Thanks, Tommy. Um, and Brooke, would you like to take us home? Yeah, I, I'm going to focus real heavily on the transparency because I think trust doesn't necessarily come without it. And and Ronnie, I'm going to share a, a story from our relationship and hopefully it's okay because I didn't think about doing this. I should have put it in a private message to you ask. No, go for it. I'm I, look. Better I, her than me. <laughs> I like that. I think the, um, you know, the thing that we that we are the least transparent about in these relationships is money, right? Because I mean, in its in its most simplest form, Tommy's trying to get the most money for Maddie and her her collaborators, and I'm trying to pay the least amount of money because I'm trying to lose the least amount of money. I mean, and I don't you I don't say that negatively. Um, we do revenue negative work. That's why we raise money. That's why we ask patrons to trust us and donate money. That's why we exist at universities where there's other structures that support what we do. Um, so I am gonna, I'm gonna lose money on almost everything I do, but how much I lose does matter. Um, so money's the thing we tend to talk about the least. And so the story I'll share <laughs> is that, you know, Ronnie and I were new to working with each other um, and we met through a couple of different things, a couple of different sort of networking connections. And there was a piece that Ronnie was representing that was really compelling um, for Utah Presents. And we had a great first time coffee meeting, sitting down at some coffee shop in New York at the end of an APAP. And we talked about the project, we talked about all the amazing community engagement we could build, we talked about why it mattered to Utah Presents, why it mattered in Salt Lake City, we talked about what the company was trying to accomplish, we, had, we did all the right things. And then when we talked about money, we didn't, we didn't go real deep. We did that thing where you kind of just do a certain thing. I said, well, what's the quote? And Ronnie said, it's this much. And I wrote that down because I take really good notes. Um, and, uh, you know, I took that number because that's the number that Ronnie gave me. And I went back and I moved around my budget and I figured out how to make it happen because because she pitched me on the project really well, right? And then when I went back to Ronnie and said, let's do it, let's do it. And I said, this is the number you gave me. And Ronnie said, yeah, it's that number. And then this, and then this, and then this. The things that she was adding on weren't unreasonable, but that's not what our conversation about money was in that coffee meeting. And it was because we, we went through it quickly because it's the most uncomfortable part of our relationship, right? And so then we had to have a moment which could have went really badly. I mean, I could have just walked away. Ronnie could have just said, well, Brooke's trying to nickel and dime us. I don't want to work with her, you know? <laughs> but we had to have a moment where we were honest and transparent. And, and that's what happened. I said, this is the number you gave me. So that's the number I made happen. And I don't have uh, more to work with. And Ronnie came back and said, this is the number I gave you for this part, but this is why we really need these other things and gave me the context. And then we met in the middle um, because at that point we were being transparent enough with each other to begin the relationship of trust, right? And so now if I'm gonna talk to Ronnie about a project, I'm gonna trust that when we talk about the money, we're both gonna know to make sure to be really clear about what that number really is. Yes, and what that number includes and doesn't include, because right. in you know in that coffee meeting where you're running out the door and you know the adding the words plus blah 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 for this extra thing becomes really important. <laughs> so, but that I mean I feel like as a result of that, working through that really honestly and frankly, um, and I think it actually ended up making our relationship stronger in the long run. Having oh, yeah. through that. And we solve the problem together, which means that we built that pathway, right? It's like building a pathway in your brain. We built that pathway in our relationship. So now we know that even if we have another conflict, conflict's not a bad thing, um, that we have a pathway already built to solve it together. Now, I'm really glad you brought up that story. 
<laughs> so I'm, so I'm, um, I would love to keep staying on and talking with these lovely folks, but I'm seeing now that we're, um, that we're a little over time. So what I want to um, transition to is first gratitude. Thank you so much to the three of you for joining and sharing time in the middle of this pandemic. We're still in a year later um, and talking about this, this topic. I'm thrilled to get all of you in the same space together and introduce some of you for the first time. Um, so just first, thank you, thank you, thank you. So appreciate it. Um, and from the awesome chat that's happening, I know everyone here um, is really appreciating it as well. Um, and then next, what I wanna say to everyone listening is thank you so much for joining as well. Um, please let folks know that this will be available um, after the fact tonight, the recording is available online um, and you can find that through producerhub.org. Um, and our next webinar is gonna be on anti-racism and accountability. And that's gonna be two weeks from today on March 18th. Um, and again, you can register for that and get more information about that and all of our future webinars at producerhub.org slash webinars. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us and please do hit us up with questions and suggestions for future webinars. Uh, this was actually uh, a recommendation um, from one of the members of the Creative and Independent Producer Alliance, who's actually here tonight. Um, so, you know, your your idea about what you need in your practice um, could be the next webinar. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Really so grateful to be in community with y'all uh, and have a fantastic night. Thank you. <laughs>